Thank you, dear Father. We can uh, preview the lesson for next week. Uh, more and more, it's getting to be interesting. Uh, based on the teachings of Jesus, we will now come into what it means to grow in our faith and grow in a relationship with Him. May we always remember that this growth is based on the faith that the Spirit gave us in the first place on what Jesus has done for us. It is always centered on Him. And as long as our eyes are fixed on Him, the Spirit will continually work His grace in our hearts that we might grow in our faith and be more like Jesus and make a difference for Him in the world. And we can worship Him and lead other people to praise Him as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so we go to John 15. I was looking for a lot of uh, verses, but uh, I think for the, from the teachings of Jesus, is there any particular passage in scriptures I was thinking that can help you understand Christian growth that Jesus extensively covered? And I picked the passage in John 15. Everybody knows what John 15 is. What's John 15? There's an analogy of John 15. The analogy of John 15 is the, the vine and the branches. And uh, remember what I told you last week? The, the salvation process uh, comes in three flavors. Okay, remember? The salvation process starts with come unto me. Right? That's the call of Jesus. Come to me. Where do you find that? In Matthew 11, 28, 29. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, from my, you know, my yoke is my burden is light. So come unto me. After he tells you to come, what then does he do? He tells you to follow me. So come to me, and then follow me. Every disciple that he called, he says, follow me. In fact, even the rich young ruler who did not end up following Jesus, what did Jesus tell him? Go home, sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and then what? Come and follow me. Okay? And after he says, follow me, this, comes, this concept comes into the picture. Abide in me. Those three basic phases of the salvation process. And if you keep this in mind, it's easy to remember. Jesus always tells you when you start the day to come to him. Don't go anyplace else. Come to Jesus. And once you come to Jesus, you realize what he wants to do with you during the day. Make sure you follow him. Okay? You follow his direction, follow his lead. And as soon as you decide and commit to that following and that obedience, the only way you're able to do that during the day for you to be empowered is to abide in him. Now, this happens every day. This is the cycle of discipleship that you need to follow. And I'll give you a, a, I'll give you a suggestion. This is... Hopefully this will be something very meaningful that you can take with uh, in terms of using your devotions every day. Uh, this is an extension of my sermon last week. I didn't have a whole lot of time and whenever I see people, you can see in their faces if they're hungry. <laughs> Thank you. So, so I, I cut short the sermon. I cut one slide and I cut this. I wanted to share this, but there was no more time. So I'll share this with you. Right now, the only way to grow in Jesus is to abide in Jesus. The way to abide in Jesus is... Make sure you remember, have a devotion with them every day. Uh, no, they are talking in generalities and, and they're being very abstract. I'll make it concrete. I will make suggestions exactly as to how you conduct your devotionals every day. And I guarantee you, if you do this, it will make a difference in your life. Because Sky Jetani, who I quote extensively last week, who talked about, remember the book that he wrote, which is with, do not, what, do not have an attitude of going under God, over God, from God, or for God. Okay? Those are all distorted pictures of the gospel and God's grace. The picture of God's grace is with God. Okay? The same guy who said all of these very, very beautiful and very challenging concepts applied this in his book. There was an appendix, and I'll share this with you in our study this afternoon. Okay? We'll cover John 15, and then, of course, as I promised Terry, you cannot avoid dealing with Calvinism and Arminianism in our, from the standpoint of Adventism. It's Wesleyanism because it's, it was through Wesley that the word, the Christian world, finally understood an alternative to Calvinism. Okay? Most of the time, people follow the Reform Movement. And the Reform Movement 
uh, follows Calvin. Okay? And, and to a point where a lot of people are saying, if you're not Calvinistic and you're in reform, you're not a Christian. That's not true. Because you can be an Armenian, and we will talk about what Armenianism is about, and still be a Christian. Okay? Uh, it's bad. Well, it's, it's not advisable for the Calvinists to say, hey, if you're an Armenian, you're not a Christian. Neither is it advisable for the Armenian to say, if you're a Calvinist, you're not a Christian. You cannot say that because, as we will see, each one of these have shortcomings. And uh, we want to be able to put them together so we can benefit the most from the scriptures. Okay? So let's turn to John 15. Let's just have a read on John 15, 1 to 11. And I want you to at least start participating. So if somebody can read John 15, 1 to 11, as we start, uh, that will be helpful. Yeah, 1 to 11. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can be can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. All the way, all the way to 11. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. All right. One of the more beautiful passages, let me give you a background on this. I can imagine Jesus. Remember John 15. When was John 15? What, 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 was, the, what was the event? that preceded John 15. That was John 14, okay? In John 14, Jesus talks about uh, having the disciples not letting their hearts be troubled because he will come back again. Why, why did he say, I will come again? Because right before John 14, he said, I'm going to go away so that they, they will kill me. Most of these people, the, the priests, you know, and those Pharisees will kill me and I, I'll fall in the hands of man. And the disciples couldn't understand. We, we've been doing this for three and a half years. You're telling me you're going to die? You're going someplace? And then Jesus basically said, John 14, don't let your heart be troubled because I'll come back. Okay. Of course, he's talking about the second coming there. So John 15 was written by Jesus in the closing scenes of his ministry. Okay? And remember, when you go John 14, 15, and 16, this is where the most uh, extensive discourse of Jesus on the Holy Spirit is found, right? When the Spirit of truth has come, another comforter, remember? Alos Parakletos, we talked about that last week. So, uh, why was he talking about the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit is the guarantee that he will be with the disciples forever. Because when you accept Jesus, the Holy Spirit starts indwelling you. And because Jesus indwells you, God, he is in you through the Holy Spirit. That's basically what he's saying. Now, because he indwells you, there's another analogy that's being that's given. The analogy is the vine and the branches, which is abiding in the vine. Okay, so you can imagine Jesus as he's talking to the disciples. They're walking through the roads of the Holy Land of Israel. And while they're walking through the roads of the Holy Land, they can see a lot of the vines. How many of you have experience in gardening here? Oh, Nida. She has experience in gardening. She gave me vegetables last week. Okay. I already cooked all the vegetables. <laughs> well, yeah, horticulture. Because when I was in PUC, 
we had to have a work program that was part of Adventist education. And one of the required, <laughs> one of the required activities and courses you take in, in the work program is horticulture. It's a, it's a nice word for gardening under the heat of the sun. Okay? <laughs> and, and I love doing that because my, two of my favorite plants when I was doing horticulture in PUC was pechai, which is bok choy, and string beans. Oh, we knew how to cultivate that. My string beans were very long and very thick, okay? And my pechai was really, oh, but they were, but up to today, one, the favorite leafy vegetable I have is bok choy. And we we'll go to the Chinese restaurant and tell the, can you add more bok choy? I want more of the leaves, okay? And because I really love the leaves. Of, and then, of course, I love string beans, not because I love kare kare only, okay? String beans, I can put string beans, put a little soy sauce there, put garlic. Yeah, everything's fine. You know? In fact, I'm hungry now thinking about that. Okay, but you plant this, and you harvest. And then, uh, when I plant the string beans, unlike pechai or bok choy, the bok choy just it grows there on the ground. And when it, it's big enough, there's leaf enough, you you harvest them. It's different when you plant uh, string beans. What do you need to do? You need to have a trellis, right, for some sort. So they because the, they crawl. So you can scroll, and then if you if you know how to hang them properly, they'll really grow and plus and wow, it, it, it's amazing vegetables. Uh, once in a while, we plant squash. How the squash grow? That's very challenging, because you know you you spend your you spend your time tilling the soil. You know, I mean, here's my my teacher tells me, all right, horticulture time. That is your plot, sir. That's our plot. <laughs> you see all the weeds and the ground, and you, you got to dig that and make it, you know, cultivate the soil, you know, to make it happen. And when you plant squash, you know what happens? The squash crawls all over what you tilled, you know, which is not really good. Okay, the vine is like that too. According to one of the commentaries I read, uh, the vine crawls and it becomes so thick. You know, you can see them 12 feet apart, but full of branches and full of leaves. And there's a problem with the vine, because and if you were a Jew during the Jesus time, you understand this. The problem with the vine is there are two kinds of branches that a vine can have. One is a fruit-bearing branch. The other does not bear fruit. Now, there's a problem. If the non-bearing fruit-bearing branch coexists with the fruit-bearing branch, what will happen? The one that doesn't bear fruit will start eating, you know, the nutrients that's intended for the fruit-bearing branch. So what do the gardeners do, the vine dressers do during the time of Jesus? The prune. Prune is nothing more than cutting those non-fruit-bearing branches. That's what they're saying. So they cut it. Why do they cut it? Because if they cut it, they'll be gone and the food intended for the fruit-bearing branches will be given to them, rather than being sapped by the non-fruit-bearing branch. That's pruning, okay? And then you follow what happens. And as soon as they're cut and you're, you're dismembered from the main vine, what happens to you if you're a branch? You wither and you die. And uh, <laughs> when the branch withers and dies, it's practically useless. You cannot use it for construction, <laughs> okay? It's not like an oak or a cedar, you know, where you can use it for wood. So, have you seen if, if a dried branch, you know, whether it's squash or any, any vine? They're ugly. They look like withered snakes. Okay. <laughs> so, so, what do they do? What they do is they, they burn them, gather them to be firewood. That's the background of the vine. And you will see this analogy in the passage. Yeah, Jesus, you know, Benji read it. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you, if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. But if you don't bear fruit, you'll be pruned, you'll be cut. So that the fruit bearing branches can have it. And you know what happens to you the moment you're pruned? You'll be stubble, you'll be firewood. You get burned. Very simple. It's, it's pregnant with a lot of meanings in terms of Christian growth. Okay? So. Don't worry about this. We'll go to that. I'm pretty sure uh, uh, Terry is waiting with anticipation for this. In, in verse 3, uh -huh. it says, You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. He's speaking to, to uh, 
believers, it sounds like. So he's already talking to people that are believers. Yes. So what he's saying, is he saying that, that uh, you're already clean because of the word of God that I spoke to you? Okay. Uh, in fact, the fact that the title of the lesson is Growing in Jesus, Growing in Jesus supposes that you were already born. Because you cannot grow unless you're born first. We'll talk about that in a little while. That's why growth in Jesus means you have to be born in Jesus first. And once you're born, you start growing in Him. Okay? And then the lesson for a week after next, you know, the, we'll be living like Jesus. Because the life is nothing more than emulating who Jesus is. Becoming like Him so the world can glorify the Father and glorify the Son. Okay, but you're right. John 15 is not for the non-believer. John 15 is for believers. Assume that they're already there. That's why the first lesson here that Jesus teaches in John 15, when it comes to Christian growth, is relationship. And how do you relate? How do you relate to God? And I'd like to borrow from an excellent, excellent sermon that David Asherick shared with us when we had the alumni retreat in Troy, Michigan. Uh, I helped out during that uh, devotional, and I cannot forget his sermon. He said, before you can abide, you must first reside. Did you get it? Let's do it again. <laughs> it's really cool. You cannot abide unless you first reside. It's a play on words. Let me translate it into our language today. You cannot live in a residence unless you first have a residence or you have an address, right? That's why we fill out the form. What's your current address? You fill out the address. What's the next question? How long have you lived there, right? They will not ask you how long have you lived there without asking you first where do you live, okay? And the point of David Nasrick was very excellent. He said, there's no way in the world you can abide if you don't first reside in Jesus Christ. He is trying to say, like Terry Kinley observed, this is useless for somebody who does not believe in Jesus Christ. This would only make sense if the person listening to Jesus believes in him already. In other words, he already resides in Jesus Christ. He is in Jesus Christ. He has been born again. The Holy Spirit resides in him, and he resides in Jesus Christ. That's why it is a relationship. It is a lesson of relating. Before you can even grow, make sure that you have a relationship with God. That's the meaning of a relationship with God. It's a two-way thing, right? A relationship is not possible unless there are two parties. Who are the two parties? It's God and you, the believer in God. Make sure that you reside in that relationship. Now, a friend of mine also explained this to me. What does it mean when you say, I am in Jesus and Jesus is in me? Have you ever thought about that? That's an abstraction that people don't understand. It doesn't mean that Jesus, that the little girl was asked, uh, is it true that the Bible says that uh, Jesus lives in me? Yeah, you go to Galatians. Yes, and then the little girl said, Mom, if that's true, then he's going to stick out. He's a lot bigger than me. <laughs> okay. So the girl was taking it literally. We're not talking about Jesus dwelling in your heart, you know, physically. What he were actually saying, please don't forget this. Next time you ask this question, there's a very, very easy way to understand that expression. In Jesus means practically in a relationship with Jesus. It's not in Jesus in your heart, but rather if I am in Jesus, it's Jesus is in me. It's nothing more than saying I am in a relationship with Jesus and Jesus is in a relationship with me. How many of you are in Facebook? Oh, you guys in that Facebook. Oh, yeah, you're Facebook. Remember, uh, I'm funny. Uh, it's funny because when somebody invited me to Facebook, I wasn't so too savvy about Facebook where you put all your personal information. So a year later, I finally said that I'm married. <laughs> I'm married to Eden Alabata. And then you know what Facebook does. As soon as you fill that out in your personal profile, Facebook will say, Bing just got married. <laughs> And, and you know who the first one was who gave me a hard time about that? Elder Denslow. That was when he moved to NAD. <laughs> so Ken, Ken gave me a message. Oh, man, you've been keeping the secret for a long time. <laughs> he, he, was, he, was poking, he was poking fun at me. Well, but basically, 
It doesn't mean, you know, when you say you're in Christ and Jesus is in you, all it is saying, you are in a relationship. And that's what Facebook asks you. Why are you in a relationship, you know? What's your marital status? And a lot of people will say, in a relationship, if they have a fiancé, in a relationship. That doesn't mean the person is in you. He's basically saying you are in a relationship with Christ. Now, how do you describe that relationship? This is very important because this relates to the rest of the passage. Uh, Pastor Milton uh, kind of covered that in one of the verses this morning in the sermon. He said, But to all who receive him, gave he the power to be called the children of God. Therefore, you are in a relationship in terms of being adopted as the child of God. Remember we talk about Ephesians 4, he predestined you, he selected you to be adopted as his child. Okay? And so that relating is me as a child. I have a father in heaven. Okay, that's what Jesus talked about. Father, how does, uh, well, how does verse 1 begin again? If you look at verse 1. I am the vine. I am the true vine. And, and my father is the gardener. Okay, so the father is there. And Jesus is the vine. Father superintends all of this. Father no, father knows best, like they say. And since father... How do you call God? We talked about this in the earlier lessons. You don't call father, God the Father the way we call them today in the English language. The, 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 the translation of Abba is not Father. What's the translation? The translation is Daddy. It's a term of endearment. Uh, and it, it's beyond the imagination of a Jew during the time of Jesus to call God Abba. Uh, how, how, how audacious can you be? How can you call the God of the universe, Ava? I mean, you're, you're a puny little sinner right here. You're an insignificant creature, creature and you call the Father, Ava? And then Jesus turns around, <laughs> if you believe in me, you can call my Father, your own Father, and we can call God, Ava. That's an awesome relationship. That's why, if you abide in me, and I abide in you. So what he's saying, reside in me. Be in that relationship with me. The first assumption, that's why in verse 3, you're already clean. You already read that, uh, uh, Terry. That's why they're, they're saying, when Jesus talked to Nicodemus, you must be born again, you know, being cleansed by water. What's the meaning of being cleansed by water? He was not, he was not just talking about baptism. To a certain extent, this explains the conversation with Nicodemus. Because what was Jesus trying to say? How were they cleansed? What does the verse say? By the word. By the word. And what's that word? The word is the good news of salvation. The word is the gospel. The, the, the Sabbath school lesson, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's a difference. Mm -hmm. It says salvation is a... I thought I read it. It says it's a two-phase thing by the Spirit and water... It, it, says, it definitely means baptism. Oh, yeah. Oh, it, remember, I said it's not only about baptism. Yes. It, it includes baptism. But primarily, baptism is meaningless and you for, unless you first are cleansed by the Word. Before you are even go to the symbol of cleansing through the water, you must be cleansed by God's Word. How are you cleansed? What Word cleanse, cleans you? It's not just an ordinary word, an ordinary doctrine. This is the goodness of salvation. Remember Romans 10, 19, we said, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the preaching of Christ, or the preaching of the gospel. And it's not just a word, it is the preaching of the good news of salvation. That's the word that cleanses you. And what happens? Because you are cleansed by the word, um, then Cleo will be able to come in. And they can sit down, they can join us now. All right. How about if we ask them questions, right? So they can <laughs> dive right in. So, welcome. Did you have a uh, lot of food? <laughs> Are you in Christ? Yes. Oh, well, see, I'll look at that. They're ready. They're ready. <laughs> they practiced that before they came in. Okay. What's the meaning of being in Christ? Trusting him fully. Wow, you see, they, they give you, it gives you, a, gives you all the abs abstractions again, okay? We said the understanding of in Christ is in a relationship with Christ. And Christ is in a relationship with you. 
It's where talk, John 15 is the basis of Christian growth. It said, you cannot abide unless you first reside. You cannot grow unless you're first born. Right? You've got to be born first before you can even grow. You've got to be a baby before you grow. Otherwise, you, there's no point in growing. And, you, and even when you fill out the, the application, I said, before they can ask you, how long have you lived in this residence? The first question is, where's your address? You cannot answer the second question unless you, you specify your address first. And you cannot answer Christian growth unless you first reside in Jesus Christ. Jesus must be in you, and you must be in Jesus. It's a matter of relating. How does that relationship become possible? It is only possible through the word that cleanses you. It's the word of the gospel. When the word of the gospel comes, you accept Jesus Christ. Then you become in Jesus, and Jesus becomes in you. The Holy Spirit indwells you, and Jesus' presence will be with you. What did he say? I will never leave you nor forsake you. All the time, Jesus will be there because the Holy Spirit is you. So, relating is the first lesson that Jesus said. In order for you to grow, make sure you are related to me. It's ridiculous when you teach your Sabbath school class. Why in the world am I talking about relating? And that's already assumed. Is it possible to be an Adventist for years and not reside in Jesus? Yeah. I don't know if you listened to my sermon last week, but my sermon last week basically talked about George Knight. George Knight uh, earned three theology degrees in our uh, denomination. He practically taught the seminary. He pastored. He did all sorts of stuff as a faithful Adventist, promising God that he will be the first perfect Seventh-day Adventist. And what did he do? He turned in, turned in his credentials. For six years, he didn't pray. He didn't go to church. And then he finally got back to church. What did he say? My, bab my Adventism got baptized. In other words, I became a Christian. It's possible to be in the church, not be a Christian. That's very important because you will understand that those people who think that they are in Christ, but they're only in a clubhouse rather than in Jesus Christ, they will not bear fruit. And we'll talk about that later on. And that's proof that they're not really in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is saying, yes, okay, you, will you may not see because faith, the work of the Holy Spirit is like the wind. You cannot see what the Holy Spirit does. But you can see the effects of the wind, right? Even if you don't see the wind, you can see the leaves moving and you know that the wind is there. Can you see the evidence in the life of somebody who is in Jesus Christ? Yes, you can. And if you don't see that evidence, that means that person might not be in Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying here. And how do you know that? Jesus is basically saying, these are lessons that you want to look into. Because if you follow these lessons, then you can be sure that you're related to him. Okay? Which takes us to the next point. Relying. When you say relying in Jesus, let's look at verse 4. John 15 verse 4 says... Abide in me and I in you. So, how does the branch get fed? Yeah, it's from the vine, right? If, let's see if I remember. What in the world is the scientific term for the study of plants? Benji, you're the scientist here. Botany? Okay, botany is the used to think uh, botany was about boots. <laughs> That's for Filipino. Yeah, even Terry got that. <laughs> and his botany started plants, you know. How, how, how are plants uh, fed? Through photosynthesis, right? Photosynthesis. So from, you know, they, they, you know there's a description of what happens. I can remember there was like, uh, yes, and there, there was a formula. Man, I I'm old. I forgot all the formulas <laughs> to memorize those, those, uh, those formulas. Anyways, uh, once the, there's a photosynthesis, the, it goes to the main trunk, the main vine. Then the vine feeds the branches okay, with the nutrients that they need. This is what Jesus said. If you abide in me and I in you, the only way you get fed is if you're connected to the vine okay uh, how do you know that you're connected to the vine <laughs> I love the way Jesus does it he tells stories unfortunately if you don't listen close enough you won't get it <laughs> As the, say, the disciples say Lord why are you 
tell a lot of the stories, the symbols. You cannot understand. You when you talk to us plainly, what did Jesus say? You know, I spoke to you in parables so that those who have ears will not listen. <laughs> you know, it, it, it speaks very deep, so you got to listen. But for, if you have the mind of a child, <laughs> the adults couldn't understand it. And Jesus said, if you have the mind of a child, you can understand what I'm saying. What is he basically saying? What's the meaning of abiding in Jesus Christ? How do you abide in Jesus Christ? Let's look, look at the other verses. He answers that in the passage too. So if you jump to verse 7, what does it say? If you abide in me and what? Oh, there you go. And my words abide in you. So the first key in abiding in Jesus is what? Oh, you make sure that you get this revelation, his words. Because, you know, MBBA, they call it MBBA, NBBA. Lourdes uh, had, and, and had friends from her Bible study group before became, she became an Adventist. And they call it NBBA. You know what NBBA stands for? It stands for not by bread alone. Ah, cool, NBBA. So the, there's a gathering of Catholics and third denominational guys. They meet at PACC. They have a Bible study. They call themselves NBBA. That's the reason why they study the Bible. The reason why they study the Bible is NBBA. Because men shall not live by bread alone. Not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. How do you abide in Christ? It is impossible for you to abide in Jesus Christ if you do not love reading His word. So we, we're talking about, you cannot understand the relationship. It's like, like the Holy Spirit. You cannot detect it. But you can see the effect of the life of someone who is related to Jesus Christ. And one of the effects of someone who is related to Jesus in his abiding is he loves the Word. So I don't care if a great many Americans say, I have been born again. I am a born again Christian, but I have no interest in praying or reading the Bible or going to church. But I'm a born-again Christian. There's no. They're not Christians. They're not part of the branch, okay? All right, so that's the first thing. Okay, let's proceed. In verse 8, he goes, But this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciple. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my Ooh, there you go, the next part. Okay, abide in His Word, and then abide in His love. You follow? So you abide in His love. Since you abide in His love, then you do the abiding. How do you exactly abide in His love? Jesus doesn't uh, mince words. He explains that to you. How do you? If you keep, verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Wow. Simple. You love His Word. You read His words. Then you begin to understand how to follow Him. How to obey Him. How to go with the principles He has in life. Okay? And then, how do you then abide in His love? Because these are my words. A lot of people are saying that the Bible is nothing more than a love letter from God to you. So that's right. It's about love because God cares. He gives you the direction in life. And what happens? He says, if you abide in my word and you follow and obey the words that you read from me, what does that do? You will abide in my love. Do you get it? That's abiding. You abide in this word. And when you learn what the word says, you begin to follow and obey the words of Jesus. Then you will abide in his love. It's cool, huh? It's very simple. I mean, you don't have to have a whole lot of commentary. Just read the passage. The passage tells you exactly what the binding is. So, how do you grow in Jesus Christ? Very simple. Growing in Jesus Christ is nurturing that relationship with Him every day. How do you nurture that relationship? You open the Word. When you open the Word, you read the Word. And after you read the Word, you make sure you become obedient to the Word. And the moment you become obedient to the Word, that becomes proof that you love Jesus Christ because he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you obey my words, that's the way you abide in my love. And you know what happens? The more you do that every day, the more you grow. Right? Simple as that. And then, so the question is fine. Okay, if you're telling me if I abide, abide in Jesus Christ, follow his word, be obedient to him, I will grow. What is the evidence that I'm growing? If you're bearing fruit, that's number three. Okay? 
Let's go to verse uh, 1 and 2. John 15. I'm a, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Okay. A lot of people who read this misunderstand the context. They thought that God will prune your life. Read the text again. Who is pruned here? Those who do not bear fruit. All right? What's that? Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. What verse was that? Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. What, what, uh, what version is that? New King James Version. Okay, New King James. You have another version there? Yeah, but on the, every branch, every branch in me that does not bear fruit. So, what version? Yeah, you, you read the last part. That's what we clear. The last part of verse 2. Alright, so there's two kinds of pruning here. What are the two kinds of pruning? The fruitless branch, he prunes. Altogether, they're gone. And there are branches that bear fruit. What does hap what happens to those branches that bear fruit? It prunes them. Okay. <laughs> so, so, well, okay, well, that's why we try to understand this passage. If you don't if you don't understand their passage, you will mis, uh, misread what Jesus is saying. What's the meaning of pruning? What's the meaning of trimming? You cut it off, right? That's why it's pruning. You chop it off. Yeah. But if you're already in here, it says, He breaks off every branch in me that does not bear fruit. So that means that there is branches into that some bear fruit some don't okay well let, let's let, let, let's let, let's read the text some more let's jump to verse 7 and go all the way to 11 okay if you abide in me and my words abide in you this is verse 7 ask whatever you wish of, and it will be done for you but this is my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples as the father has loved me so I will love you abide in my love if you keep my commandments you will abide in my love just say I have loved my father's commandments and love. these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you okay go to verse Eight again, but this my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciple. Go back to verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown in the fire and burned. Who is this in verse 6? Oh, okay, well, this is very important. You got it. Remember, reside and abide. Those are two different things. Anyone who does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch. What happens if you don't abide? If you do not abide, you are thrown away and you're burned. Okay? How are you thrown away? You're going to throw you away. You got to be cut first before you're thrown away. Right? That's, that's, why we're, that's where the pruning is. You got to chop you off first. And then, re all I'm trying to say, there is indications in the passage that you will be, maybe if I may draw it, I'm not the good drawer, here's the vine. Okay? And here's the branch, right? And the branch can have smaller branches, some twigs, right? Uh, so if some people read the text, Okay, maybe pruning because I am a fruit-bearing guy is eventually I will have grapes, right? I will have grapes here. God prunes those twigs. Okay, well, 
my suggestion is you look at the entire passage. All that the passage is saying, if you don't bear fruit, you'll be pruned. Okay? Why are you pruned? No, so that the fruit-bearing branches can bear more fruit. Why? What happens if this branch right here, who doesn't have any fruit, okay, remains in the vine? It eats up the nutrients that goes up, right? There's, there's food going through the main branch, main, the vine, that goes here. It also goes here. If they coexist, what happens? This guy eats up the fruit that the food that this branch is fruit-bearing needs. So what happens when they chop this off? The food supply doesn't go there anymore. More of the food supply goes to the branch. Why? Because Jesus is saying, the more you abide in me, the more food I give to you, and the more fruit you will bear. And the only way for that to happen is for me to go and start chopping off people who do not bear much fruit. Okay. Well, that's why. We will, then we will begin to go here, okay? No, I, I don't, I'm still not sure about that. Okay. Right. Could branches be that don't bear fruit be things in your life that are bad? Or, I mean, like... That's one way to look at it, okay? You can boil it and then drink. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. that's, that's, that's a different name. That's true. You know, I like graviola. I drink graviola tea. It's the guyabano tea. Uh, you, that's that's 10,000 times more powerful than the regular antioxidant. So if you get cancer, they say take graviola tea. It will arrest the growth of your cancer cells. Okay? But the graviola tea doesn't come from the guyabano fruit. It comes from the bark and it comes from the leaves. That's where Benji is coming from. But that's not what the passage is talking about, okay? What the passage is talking about is a branch that's being fed by the vine that bears fruit. And it also talks about a branch that's being fed by the vine, but it doesn't bear fruit. Yeah, without going over here yet, yeah. if, there, if you're in, in the verse 3 or whatever it was, these people are already clean. These people are, uh -huh. are saved, they have new hearts. Mm. So, you're saying that God cuts them off and throws them in the fire. All right. Yeah, that's what it's saying. I'm not saying it. That's what John 15 is saying. Okay. So, who's, who's being cut off here? Look at the passage. Who's being thrown in the fire? Okay, it's a fruitless branch. And basically, that's it. The fruitless branch is the one thrown in the fire. Okay, is, is, is anything thrown in the fire from the fruitful vine? Yeah. Yeah. That there are fruits. He prunes those fruits, uh, those branches that bears fruit, that they may bear more fruit. Okay. What, yeah, but what, what's, uh, when you say he, he prunes the branch that, that, does not, that, that bears more fruit, what, what is the pruning process? Let's repeat what the pruning process is. I have a branch that bears fruit. How will I have this branch to bear more fruit? If I, if I give him more food, right? If I give him more food, he will bear more fruit. There are two kinds of branches in terms of the vine. There's a vine that bears fruit. There's also a vine that does not bear fruit. Okay? And pruning, I'm not talking about the passage yet, okay? Pruning in terms of the horticulture during the time of Jesus is the, the vine dresser looks for the vine that doesn't bear fruit. You know, if, if they see like buds here and there's already fruit coming up and this doesn't have fruit, you know, they should bear fruit at the same time. What does he do? Why does he cut the fruit, the, the branch, so that the food that's supposed to go there goes there and when it goes there, he bears more fruit. Okay, so... So now we come into grips, into saying, uh, what are those branches anyways? Okay, uh, when you say, oh, if I'm pruned and I'm a fruitful branch, there will maybe some twigs going in here. So the question now comes, is it possible for you, when you are saving Jesus Christ, to still be lost? Okay, let me use the word of John 15 first. Is it possible for you, 
if you already is in the vine and you start bearing fruit and still be pruned. Yes? Because so that I will bear more fruit. Yeah, because if, but if you're fruit, if you're pruned, you'll be cut off. Yes, that's what. You, yes, that's what it's saying. Okay, okay. So, uh, let, uh, we're talking about the, the abstract pictures. Let me put it to where the rubber meets the road. When you accept Jesus Christ, you become a child of God. Is it possible for you to cease to be a child of God tomorrow? Okay, that's, that's one answer, okay? <laughs> one answer is, yes, if you do not remain in Him, okay, if you do not remain in Him, you will be pruned, be gone. Okay, that's one possible answer. The other answer is, hey, you were not really a fruitful branch in the first place. In other words, you were not really saved in the first place. You were not really a child in the first place. If, 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 if they really... Were one of us, he would. I can't remember his exact sure. verse. Sure. So if 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 they don't don't uh, don't uh, don't gripe about that, but that's what Jesus is trying to say. If they're not with us, if they're not for us, they're not with us. Okay. For example, was Judas fruitful? Well, yeah, he did perform some miracles, right? He was with the disciples. He taught with the disciples. Well, was Judas ever with Jesus at all? Yes, he was physically with Jesus, but his heart was never with Jesus. He was never converted. Okay, so you got two answers to the question. One answer is, hey, can I be cut off as a child of God tomorrow if I don't remain in the branch? That is an answer of the Armenian. If I mess up tomorrow, I can be cut off as a child. I'll no longer become a child. The answer of the Calvinist is, hey, you don't bear fruit. You will never a child in the first place. Okay? What does the Bible say? Ask the question. Uh, so let me translate it. And I've asked this from you last, last week. How many of you, if you die tomorrow, or if Jesus were to arrive, come today, and Jesus come back, comes back tomorrow, how many of you are sure that you'll be in heaven? Come on, don't look at me. I'm asking you. I'm the one asking the question, okay? If I go to heaven, it will only be because of the, the, the work that Christ did. Not understood, do. understood, understood. But are you sure you'll be in heaven, Terry? That's not my question. My question is, you know, you know the reason why I'll be in heaven. You're not going to go to heaven because of the golden street. You're going to go to heaven because of Jesus Christ. But how sure are you that you'll be in heaven tomorrow? Yes, make your election sure. Now she's, he's talking like a Calvinist, okay? We'll talk, we'll talk to that in a little while, okay? Come on, guys, you answer my question. How many of you are sure you'll be in heaven if Jesus were to come back tomorrow? What makes you sure, Cleo? Because of Jesus. He died for me. He saved me. Because of his promises. All right, because of his promises. God promises, he can fulfill the promises, the power to do it. So you're sure. Cool. So... Okay. All right. So now, which is really cool. I love that answer. It's very picturesque there, the, uh, the Benji. But let me go back to what you said earlier. If I don't remain in him between now and tomorrow when Jesus comes back and I don't remain in him, is it possible for me not to get to heaven? How can you be sure then? Well, the choice is clear. Mm -hmm. I have to make a clear choice. If you remain in him, if you remain in him, that is evidence that you are saved and you have that assurance of going to heaven. All right, okay. What's the meaning of remaining in him? If you love me, you keep my commandments. Oh, oh okay, cool. In, you remain in him, by, 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 you abide in him by keeping his commandments, dwelling in his word, and following his word. What happens between now and Jesus coming back tomorrow if you sin, even one sin? Heaven to take yeah. care of all that. His righteousness has clothed you. Well, so the, the enemy will turn around and say, you have an advocate, but according to John 15, if you follow Jesus in order for you to bear fruit, you must abide in his love by following his commandments. You violated one commandment. You're going to go to heaven. Okay, so then how come you're sure that you'll be in heaven? 
Okay, all right, cool. Now, you're beginning to understand what it means. You do not look at your assurance in terms of what you can do and how, how much fruit that you are bearing. That's not what the passage is saying. Assurance doesn't come by measuring how much fruit you bear. Assurance comes by making sure that you're abiding in the vine. How do you abide in the vine? You abide in the vine by faith. What's the meaning of abiding in the vine by faith? That despite the fact that I still have infirmities, I still have some weaknesses, I'm a child of God. And when God looks at me, He really doesn't see me. He looks at me and sees Jesus Christ. What does it take for Jesus to cover me with His righteousness and for God to see Jesus in me? Not for me to work myself to death in order to be perfect. All it takes is for me to trust that Jesus is enough for me. You know what the spirit of prophecy says? Even the weakest saint, the weakest saint, if he only says, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief, will be saved. So where does assurance come? Assurance comes not from what you do, but by believing on what Jesus has done for you. All right, let's go here now. Uh, and let's make, let's stick in the plot. This will be interesting. Let's go to John 6. I'm trying to transition to this diagram here on the left so you'll understand what we're talking about. Somebody read John 6. I think we start with 37. I want to make sure that we start there. gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out okay what does the first part say Leo all that the father gives me will come to me and, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out okay how many did the father give to the son oh. okay read it again <laughs> Mean all. Okay, yes. The, and the context will tell you what this all is about. This, the all here refers to everybody. Only the one who comes to him. Yes! Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Don't inject any preconceived ideas. Let's look at the text. Let's see what the text is trying to tell you. All what? All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast, be, and I'll never cast out. These people who come to Jesus will never be cast out. They will have surety. They will have assurance. That's what this is saying here. But they can only be sure of that assurance if what? If they've been given by the Father to the Son. How many are given by the Father to the Son in the passage? Okay. My sheep hear my voice. Okay, before we go there, it's there, let's just go to the passage because the passage is clear. Okay. Does it say all men? No. It only says all who come to Jesus are the ones that the Father gave to the Son. Did the Father give all men to Jesus? Careful with your answer. Look at the passage. He gave, uh, in particular, Judas Iscariot to the Okay, that doesn't answer John 6, 37, okay? <laughs> the, because the, the set is limited to those who come to Jesus who will never be cast out. Say that Judas was cast out, okay? We know that, okay? So, in other words, only those that the Father gives to the Son will never be cast out. Is that what the text is saying? Yes, it is. Okay, next question. Will everybody be saved? No. So some will be cast out. Therefore, if they're not cast out, they were not given by the Father. Are you following? Given by the Father because, first of all, they rejected. Oh, okay. Let's not say they because they rejected. It's understood. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> all right. Cleo is an excellent theologian. Okay, all right. No, does the text say? That does the text say that the Father gives them to the Son because they accepted and the Father did not give them because they rejected? What does it say here? Because they came to the Son, that's why the 
Father gave them to him. The will of the Father is that Jesus will not lose. I shall lose none of all that he has given me. Oh, cool. Okay, what text is that again? That's verse 39. Okay, let's read what Benji is saying. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Question. When nothing of what group? Is it all of mankind? Nothing of all those who accepted Jesus. There you go. Okay, it, it, it's, Jesus is basically saying, all that the Father gives me will come to me. They'll never be cast out. And it is the will of my Father that what? What does it say again, Benji? That nobody will be lost. <laughs> okay. What? Lost. Who will not be lost? What is the will of the Father? That should lose nothing at all that He has given me. In other words, this group of people that the Father gave to the Son, I pray that nobody will be lost from them. And that they will never be cast out. Question. That group that was given to the Son, is that all of mankind? Cannot be. Because not everybody will be saved. Only the save was given by the Father to man. Okay. Here's the issue. So if only the save were given by the Father to Jesus Christ, what about the unsave? Oh, oh yes. Okay. We know that's the consequence. But did the Father give them to the Son? No. no. They were not given to the Son. That, that's why they will be cast out. Aha. Uh -huh. Now here's the question. Let me rephrase it, and then we'll come to this diagram really close now. Those who were given by the Father to the Son were chosen or elected by Him to be given to the Son, right? And those who were not chosen were not elected, right? Therefore, God elects those who will be saved, and God does not elect those who will not be saved. Right. Everybody's Calvinist now, okay? <laughs> All, right. All right, so let's look at this first, and then we will look at the diagram that I gave you. Oh, by the way, there's a handout here, so you guys can follow me. This is a summary, this is a Venn diagram that summarizes the concepts of salvation and the groups of salvation, okay? There is now a big teaching. Uh, Rob Bell is one of the most famous young pastors and young theologians today. He was even featured by Time Magazine. He wrote the bestseller entitled God Wins. And the basic premise of the book is there's really no hell. Everybody will be saved in the end. What's the meaning of everybody will be saved in the end? That's the teaching of what we call universalism. Universalism means everybody will be saved. Nobody will be lost. All who are born of Israel will glory. Yeah. Okay, universalism has nothing to do with race or anybody. Universalism, regardless of who you are, everybody will be saved by God. That's what the teaching is. All are saved. Jews, non-Jews, Gentiles, or nobody will be lost. That's universalism. That's why it's a heresy. Does the Bible teach that everybody will be saved? Uh, very clear. The teachings of Jesus in Matthew 7 says, a lot of people will come to me in the last days will say, we have done good things in your name. We have cast out demons in your names. What will God say? Depart from me. I know you not. And then he separates the, what? The sheep and the goats. The Catholics, so, the what's that? The Catholics, they are the universal church. That's what they believe. But then it's still not everybody will be saved. Yes. The Catholics say they're the universal church. But there's been a teaching of the church for the longest time that if you don't become part of the mother church, you're cut off from salvation. So you, become, you have to become a Roman Catholic in order to benefit from salvation. That has been relaxed by Vatican too. But that's not what universalism is. Basically, Rob Bell in his book, that's why it's being very popular right now, gets rid, gets rid of hell and tells everybody that everybody will be saved in the end. Yeah, there's really no point. It, uh, this is all a sham. I mean, why study the Bible, why we talk about this, and then why did Jesus have to die on the cross? You know, I mean, really, you, you water down the gospel so much, there's no meaning to the gospel anymore. That's why it's a sham. And a lot of people are questioning what, except for, it's very, very attractive to the itching ears of people today, right? Oh, I can do my thing and I can still be safe, right? So that's what they do. 
So it's popular. Definitely not biblical. Therefore, if you go to the opposite side, it says not all are saved. That's why it's called particularistic, particularism. There even made the, his iPhone pronounce that. Okay. Particularism is the opposite of universalism. Universal and particular. What's the difference? Universal means all. Particular is only a certain segment. Therefore, when we say universalism says all are saved, particular means only a particular group of people will be saved because not everybody will be saved. Only a subset will be saved. That's what it means. Now this is gone. We, we, we are faced with two basic thoughts, Calvinism and Armenian, Armenianism among the Christians today. Some people, okay, believe that the cross of Jesus and what Jesus did is unlimited in its accomplishment. That's what Calvinist says. Armenians, Armenianism says it's unlimited in its extent. Okay, don't worry about the terms right now. We will explain that later on. Okay, Armenian says it's limited in accomplishment. Calvinism says it's limited in extent. I want you to go to the handout so you can understand what we're talking about. There's a grid. At the bottom, there's a picture of John Calvin, and there's a picture of John Wesley. Let me tell you ahead of time right now, uh, it was Arminius who was a very brilliant student of Calvin. Okay? And the, he, in fact, he defended Calvin against one who questioned the teachings of Calvin because he had a very deterministic God. But in the process of re his research, he found some loopholes in Calvinism. So he introduced what we call Arminianism, Jacobus Arminius, okay? So, but the sign of the Dort, which is uh, the reform movement in the Christian world, rejected the teaching of Arminius, and Calvinism became very popular. Today, Calvinism is still very popular. There's a lot of people in Christendom today who will not even accept Arminians into seminary if they do not believe in Calvin, okay? Now, where does the Adventist Church fall into place? I'd like to be very, very, very clear with you. We are more closely aligned to, I'm sorry, before we even go there, Arminius wasn't very successful in propagating his teachings. There was another guy who eventually made the teaching of Arminius very popular. He's called John Wesley. John Wesley is the father of Methodism. He started the concept of small groups. You know, we think the small groups is a new concept. John Wesley started it during his time. And John Wesley now, that's why when you say Wesleyanism, it's closely tied to Arminianism. He's, uh, he's 100 years removed from Arminius, but John Wesley introduced Arminianism for today. Where does the Adventist church stand? The Adventist church is closer to John Wesley than they are, they are close to John Calvin. What does that mean? Let's look at the handout. There's the picture of John Calvin. There's a picture of John Wesley. This is what Calvinism teaches. It is summarized with the flower called tulip. That's why it's so easy to remember and a lot of people follow this. It's very convenient. Nobody came up with a really good acronym for Wesleyanism and Arminianism, which this guy changed. And I'll remember I'll be sharing it with you. Tulip means total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. Total depravity means man has no capacity to come to God at all. He is dead in his spirit, so therefore he has no capacity to save himself or even inch his way towards salvation. Unless God takes the initiative, he cannot save himself. That's total depravity. What is unconditional election? Unconditional election says even before the foundation of the world, God elected and predestined those who will be saved. Not on the basis of what they decide, but on the basis of His grace alone. In other words, if I chose Cleo from the foundation of the world, that she will be part of the elect, she will be saved forever. When my son comes, she will, Cleo will be saved. I do not choose her because of her faith. I choose her because I elected her from my gracious love. That's what they believe. Okay? That's why it's called unconditional election. There were no conditions in the election. God simply says, hey, there's a group of people I'm going to give to my son, and they will never be cast out. There's a group of people that will never be pruned. I'm going to give it to my son. They will never be lost. 
without any conditions. That's why we talk about unconditional love. There was no condition in the election. God basically just elected you unconditionally. That's Calvinism. Which resulted in the third part, which is L. Because not everybody will be saved, and not everybody was chosen to be saved. Therefore, the atonement was only done by Jesus, not for everyone, but only for those who have been given by the Father to the Son. In other words, Jesus really limited the atonement and limited the cross only to those who will be saved. Okay? I'm not saying this is right. I'm just describing it right now. Now, I means irresistible grace. What's the meaning of irresistible grace? When the message of salvation comes to you and the message of grace comes to you, you cannot resist it because you have been elected since eternity. Once it gets to you, you will be drawn by God, whether you like it or not. That's why it's irresistible. That's why that's funny. When we had the congregation in Insdale, what was the theme in the congregation? Irresistible Christ. I think that's what they said. Whoa, I said, Elder Pichette and the conference officers in Illinois are Calvinistic. <laughs> I was the only one thinking about that. Maybe Terry too. <laughs> but with, irresistible grace means when the grace comes, you cannot resist it. Okay? And then you know what perseverance of the saints means? Hey, because you've been elected by God and you did not resist the grace, and since you for sure you'll be saved, you will persevere. No question. That's why once you're saved, you will always be saved. Did you get it? Uh, they, they, have, they have verses to prove this. You could get, go to Ephesians. You can look into this. And uh, God said, He foreknew you. There's a word foreknew. What's the meaning of foreknew? Did I use all the colors already? For. For no. For no is nothing more than knowing beforehand. That's why it's for, no. When you use the word no in Hebrew language, it is not a simple head knowledge. Because if you read in Genesis, it says, then Adam knew Eve and Cain was born. What does that mean? It, the, Adam didn't go to Eve and say, honey, what's your name again? Where do you live? And then a child was born. That's not what it means. It's basically saying they had the physical union, and out of the physical intimacy, a son was born. In other words, they reproduced because the knowledge. So it's an intimate knowledge. It is not just head knowledge. And when you say for no, even before the world began, God already knew Terry, God already knew Ernie, God already knew Cleo. If we are elect, he already knew us. And out of his love, he said, I'm going to save you and you adopt you as my kids. You will be my children in Jesus Christ. That's for no. He did not just choose you by random. He, from his heart, selected and elected you from eternity. That's what they're trying to say. Okay? Yeah, you're a pretty good argument, right? A very good one. Okay, so a very good one. Okay, cool. Now let's go to the other part. Let's go to West. Is this the same as all are sinful? Yes. Well, we'll let's, go to, let's go to the other side. This one right there, and I like him. I just downloaded this book in Kindle yesterday. I think this is one of the best books that you can get. Uh, did I, I didn't put the, I didn't put the, the website. I'll, I'll share with you the website. I'll, I'll, I'll upload it. Basically, he's saying... I will give you an acronym for Wesleyanism because there has been no acronym. They tried Tulip, they tried Daisy, they tried Roses. I will give you an acronym. The acronym is a car. <laughs> Calvinism has a flower. I'll give you a car. And I'll not just give you a car. I'll give you a very nice car. An Acura, okay? <laughs> and he says that. It's an Acura. It's a car. <laughs> so it's easy to remember. It's an Acura. Okay. Whereas Calvinism is Tulip, Arminianism or Wesleyanism is Acura. What is Acura? Used to be a total depravity is the same. Alf Calvinist and Arminius and John Wesley believes the same in terms of men's incapacity to respond to salvation and go towards God. What, but if you make it T, it becomes Tikura. It, you know, it sounds Japanese, okay? So, and then you change it to all are sinful. That's the same. Total depravity is all are sinful. Just, just to make it uh, readable, it became accurate, okay? Not a whole lot of difference in the total depravity. 
Now there's a difference the moment you go to the second part. Whereas the Calvinist says it's unconditional election, it is conditional election for the Armenian or the Wesleyan. In other words, you were not elected without any condition. God chose you based on your decision to be in Jesus Christ. Okay? I'm just stating this stuff, okay? Let's see how, how strong the arguments will, will stand in terms of the biblical testimony. And because it's conditional election, when Christ died, he did not only die for a few. It is an unlimited atonement. Everybody was saved by the cross of Jesus. Everybody was atoned for. And when you read John 3.16, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The gospel comes to you, but you're able to resist it. That's why it's not an irresistible grace. It's resistible grace. And then in the end, it's not a matter of one save, always save. It is a matter of assurance of salvation. The Wesleyan says, as long as you keep on believing, if you hold on to Jesus, especially today, if you believe in Jesus today, can you be sure? Yes. In fact, he's saying, don't bother with this theoretical squabble and debate about can you be lost one of these days in the future? Why think about the future? Think about today. Are you committed to Jesus today? That's what they're saying. That's what, that's what, that's what I, I like in the Wesleyan side. And in fact, who can predict what's going to happen in the future? If you believe in Jesus right now and you tell Jesus, I am so bad, I still mess up, but I rely on your righteousness and your sacrifice for me. Are you saved? You'll, yes, you're saved. If Jesus comes right now, you'll be in heaven because you believe in him. That's what he's trying to say. That's why they stress assurance, whereas the other one stressed, one save always says, there's, there's perseverance, you will never be lost again. And notice, Calvinism falls if you break one of the links. Okay, let me try to explain that. Why is election important for the Calvinists? Because you're totally depraved. Yeah? You, cannot, you have no capacity to respond to God. God needs to awaken you. And because God needs to awaken you, before He awakens you, He will select the people He will awaken. Are you following? That's why now when He selects the people He will awaken, does He select everybody? Uh, proof is He doesn't select everybody. So therefore, it's, it's unconditional election. I'll just select them out of my grace. And because he selected the group, because they already selected, God said, my son will die for you. It's a limited atonement. And because my son did, died for you and you already elected, you're going to resist the grace. Because I already elected you. You will never be cast out. You'll never be lost. And you know what? Because I elected you and my son, you will persevere towards the end. That's what Calvinism is. You break one of those, it's going to fall. It will be very weak. Calvinism will not stand. Okay? That's why... Let me give you this as, uh, as an aside. There were two people who reviewed the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the 19, I think late 1950s into the 60s. They, their name was uh, Barnhouse and Walter Martin. They said, are you a legitimate Christian group? You Seventh-day Adventists, a lot of people call you cults, right? And they, they, they wrote a book entitled, uh, I think, uh, The Kingdom of the Cults. And they did conclude that you can be a Christian, you can be an Adventist and still be a true Christian. Okay? The most sympathetic review of the Adventist church. They went to all our theology. People sat down. Of course, we are still raggling about that in church today, about questions and doctrine that came out. Okay? You know why? You know why they're very sympathetic to the Adventist church? Because Barnhouse and Martin are not pure Calvinists. You know what they call themselves? I am a Calminian. You know what the Calminian means? It's a Calvinist that believes in Arminianism. Because they say, that's why they say, how many points are this? These are five points. They say, are you a five-point Calvinist or a three-point Calvinist? You know what that means? I only believe three points of what Calvin teaches. I believe two points of Arminian. There will be two-point Calvinists. And if you become a one-point Calvinist, what's the use of being a Calvinist? Go to the other side. But that's what they're trying to say. So here's what I'm, uh, here's the, the, the bottom line is they accepted the Adventist church because they were not Calvinists. There's another book written by Anthony Hokima, a very brilliant Reformed scholar entitled The Four Major Cults. 
the cults of the Jehovah's Witnesses, and one of the cults in the four major cults, a very thick book, is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He cannot accept the Adventist Church as a legitimate Christian body. You know why? Because Anthony Hokima is a staunch Calvinist. People detest the teaching of the investigative judgment and are teaching about prophecy, particularly the Calvinist. They say it's not biblical, okay? So let me just warn you, if you start talking to your Christian brothers and sisters, if you talk to a Reformed Christian, they'll be less sympathetic to you as an Adventist. You talk to most Baptists who are Wesleyan and uh, Armenian, they'll be more sympathetic to you. Okay? Who, who are the Wesleyans? The Methodists. The Methodists are closer to the Adventists. In fact, we learned about the Seventh-day Sabbath from, from the Methodists, and, you know, Rachel Oaks and that, that story. But that's the, that's the aside. Okay. Now, what will make sense? Uh, here's what the teaching of the Armenian camp is. Why did God have a conditional election? If you look at this, this other part, if God conditionally elected you based on your faith in Jesus Christ, that will tell you that he died for everybody, right? He died for everybody, but some will resist the grace of Jesus Christ and they will not be saved. Those who will not resist will be saved. And those who will not resist the grace of Jesus Christ and keep on trusting Him, keep on believing, they will have an assurance of salvation. See, they're also connected. Okay? Both of these have weaknesses. Both Calvinism and Arminianism and Wesleyanism have weaknesses. But this is the suggestion I'd like to give. And I think this is the best testimony to the test to, to the revelation of scripture let's go to Ephesians 1 Ephesians 1 and talks about the predestination verse 4 somebody read that well read 3 and 4 so it will be clear and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Verse 4. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. How did God choose us? There's two words there. Before that. Before, before, yeah, before the foundation of the world, we chose... Okay, read, read that again, Cleo. Jesus, he chose us in him. This is key. That made uh, Karl Barth one of the most... Karl Barth was one of the most brilliant German theologians because Karl Barth was a theologian who said that the center of theology must be Jesus Christ. Okay? Here's the problem with Calvinism and Arminianism. They go against conditional and unconditional election if you call if you concentrate on conditional and unconditional election who are you concentrating on are you concentrating on men or are you concentrating on jesus okay even if you if you do conditional election you're also centering on men okay here's the point they're saying predestination and election in Ephesians is based on this based on this phrase in what in him and they're saying before anything else before anything else it's not who's elected who will not be cast out who will be pruned that is not the question the question that's being posted is who begins the process okay according to the Bible how many were created through Jesus Christ. All things were made through Him, by Him, and for Him. Okay? Does that include the election? Hello? Yeah, right. But for the election, no. He chose, before the creation of the world, He chose us to be holy and uh, blameless. And okay. Holy. All right. Holy and blameless. Okay, but I mean, and then he predestined to be adopted. Okay, Let, let's go b before you go farther. There, Benji, it says, 
in him was created all things. Isn't election a concept? Who came first, election or Jesus Christ? In fact, the passage is saying election is pre and predestination is not viable unless it is done in whom? This is key. Without Jesus Christ, election and predestination is not possible. Therefore, Jesus must be the center of election. It is not men who will be the center of election. Are you following? It will not make sense if you do not understand election and coordination and predestination apart from Jesus Christ. Therefore, it must be understood in Jesus Christ. That's why there's the issue of the discussion, and I don't want to belabor this point. There is now an issue of what they call a corporate predestination or an individual predestination. A lot of the Armenians are saying, hey, since you're elected in Jesus Christ, you are corporately elected and predestined in Jesus Christ. And if you are in Jesus Christ, then you're corporately, and then you're corporately elected by Him. This is what the Armenian says. And uh, Calvin says, that's not true. Whenever we talk about salvation, the salvation that God gives is always personal, right? Whoever believes in Him, it is individual. Okay, how do we resolve this? Simple enough. If God elected and predestined you in Jesus Christ, are you following me? So it is only possible for you to be adopted. It is only possible for you to get the inheritance if Jesus dies, right? And fulfills the plan of redemption. If he accomplishes it because Jesus does it, it is possible for you to be part of the elect. Okay? Who will be saved in the last days? Those who are in him. Who will not be cast out? Those who are in him. Okay? Who will never be lost? Those who are in him. Question, how are you in him? How can you be in him? Ah, we go back here. It goes back there. In other words, if Ephesians is saying God elected you from the beginning, in Jesus Christ, how did he come to elect you? Because when he elected you in Jesus Christ, you, he, know, he knew from the get-go that you will be in Christ. What's the meaning of being in Christ? You will be in a relationship with Christ. What's the meaning of being in a relationship with Christ? You will accept Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, the argument is this. That's weird. I mean, how can God elect you and have a personal knowledge of you? You were not yet born. That's an abstract concept, right? You are not yet born. Therefore, that's absurd. If you interpret Ephesians 1 and say, oh yeah, Cleo was elected from the very beginning, even before the world was created. He was, she was already foreknew by, foreknown by God. Therefore, he was foreknown by God. There was an intimate relationship, an intimate knowledge of God about Cleo. And she will be saved in Jesus Christ. But Cleo is not yet born. So the Calvinist is saying, what you're saying is absurd. I have a response. The Bible says the Lamb was slain since the foundation of the world. Meaning to say, that sin entered the universe before earth was created to have life in it. Because Christ, okay. God, already <laughs> okay. knew that Satan is the son of the Sunday, right. like a fire. Yes, okay. Okay, right. That'll probably be for next week, okay, <laughs> Benji. We'll relate it to here. Basically, what we're saying is the fact that you're selected in Jesus Christ and the fact that the Lamb was slain since the foundation of the world, I can tell you, how can you say that? It's absurd. Calvary is not, Calvary wasn't there yet. The earth wasn't there yet. How can you say that the lamb will be slain on the cross when in fact there was no mountain where the cross will be put in? And you know what I'm trying to say? So it's absurd in believing that you are in him even before you were born. Why? Here's the problem. And let me submit to you the way I look at this. And people try to, to split hairs to make this, to understand this. I submit to you, you cannot fully understand it. Okay? Why can God say that Jesus died before the foundation of the world? Because He is God. You follow me? Because He is God. Satan is 
going to do what? Okay, be, uh, before you continue your story, uh, Benji, I'll ask you. How can God say Jesus was already slain when in fact the world in which he was supposed to die he wasn't created yet? Because God already knew that he was going to create man in his image. Okay, you're not answering my question. Uh, yeah, no, you're, you're not. Okay. Okay, not be, because he already knew that doesn't mean he can die. Because there's no place where he can die. Oh yeah. Okay, just because he knows it, can can you then say that uh, he was slain since the foundation of the world? You know what slain is? That's a past. That's a past tense. He was already slain since the foundation of the world. In principle, he was slain since the foundation of the world. So all the all the saved were already actually saved. You know. Yeah. Well, well, I'll go there. Let me just let's. Yes. Jesus is all knowing guy. He foreknew that. He foreknew that even before, without the world being formed, that the the sun would die. He knew what okay. was okay. going to happen. Okay. Okay. It 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 did not say the sun would die since the foundation of the world. It say this, this, the lamb was slain since the foundation of the world. Uh, let me cut to the chase. God never talks in terms of the past and the future. When he was asked, who do I say that I am? What did, uh, what did God say? Hey, you tell them, I am. He's the eternal now. He's not bound by time. So when God says, God the Son says, Father, I'll be the one to go there and I'm going to die. As soon as Jesus said, I'm going to die, it was tantamount to reality because we're talking from the perspective of God. Are you following? From the perspective of God, Jesus was as good as crucified on the cross when he promised he's going to die for us. That's why when Ernie says, because he promised, that's very strong. When God promises, it's going to be fulfilled because it's God promising it, right? Why? Because we're look, they're looking at it from the perspective of God. I got news for you. There's a God and we're not Him. And we cannot look at it from the perspective of God because we are not God. We can only look at the perspective of history, which is a limitation of time and space from our end. So in terms of us, when did Jesus die? He died 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary, right? About thousands of years after Adam, Adam and Eve sinned. But in the perspective of God, when did he die? He died since the foundation of the world. Okay? I hope that's settled. Now let's translate this to the in him, in Ephesians. From the very beginning, God already chose you in Jesus Christ even before you were born. How is he able to say that, that you're chosen in Jesus and he knew that you will be in a relationship with Jesus even before you were born? Because he is God. Are you following? He was talking from the perspective of God. Now when we look at Cleo, and she's part of the elect. When were you baptized, Cleo? 1987. Oh, look, you can remember, 1987. She was baptized in 1987. She accepted Jesus Christ in 1987. So, when, when somebody asks you, when were you saved, Cleo? Oh, I accepted salvation in 1987. That's Cleo talking about the limitation of time and space. Someday when you go to heaven and we're in heaven, Cleo, you ask God, when was Cleo saved? Oh, Cleo, I saved you before the foundation of the world. Now because you're talking God language, you're already going into the dimension of God, which we are not in right now. So here's my counsel about this. When you talk about Arminianism, John Wesleyanism, and Calvinism, be careful. Don't play God, because you're not God. And when you don't understand it, leave it to God. And what you understand, go with what you understand. And have faith in God. Yes. Um, so it brings me to the last part of our study. How do we put flesh into this? This is your devotionals. And I challenge you. I challenged the kids right last night in our small Bible study group. How do you grow as a Christian? You cannot grow as a Christian if you do not abide in God's word and you do not pray. And you don't have a devotional life. How do you have a devotional life? Sky Jitani is saying, this helped me in understanding what it means to communicate with God every day. Don't worry, I got more documentation because when I gave you this, this whole thing is documented here. Okay? 
I hope you take time to read this when you go home, but let me summarize it for you. There was a discipline during the early years of the church called Divina, what does it say there? Lectio Divina, which is divine reading. He's saying the way they did it, they did not only read the scriptures. They had the discipline that they went through in order to grow with Jesus Christ. And let me go, cut to the chase, look at this very quickly. First thing they say before you start the day, well, you, when you start the day, do reading. Open God's word and read the passage of scripture. If you want to concentrate on Proverbs, you go to Psalms, if you pick a, a, a gospel, it doesn't matter. You open God's word and read it, okay? First thing is just read it. What's the next thing that you do? You meditate. After you read the word, meditate. This is not transcendental meditation. This is not mystical Zen. This is not Buddhism. If you read the documentation, reading and meditating is nothing more than allowing what you read to examine your life. Are you following? After I read this, let's say, if you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. How do you meditate? You then ask yourself, God is saying, if I abide in him and I, you know, and, and he in me, I will bear much fruit. That I allow the text to talk to me in terms of meditation. Am I bearing much fruit? That's your, then you start asking, you're telling me this in your word, Lord. And I look at my life, am I really bear, am I abiding in Jesus Christ? Is, really, is God really abiding in me? Do I sense that intimacy between the two of us? That's meditating. After you process that, then you speak. You know what speaking is? You turn around instead of God talking to you. Now you turn around and you talk to God. What do you tell God? Lord, I've been amiss. Really, if I'm honest, that's, there's not a whole lot of fruit in my life. In fact, if I'll be, if you're really mean, you'll probably prune me in the next second, you know. Honestly, Lord, I I'm not a very productive servant of yours. This is you start talking. Lord, that's why I'm praying to you right now. I really want to be productive. Okay, I learned this from, from what you just read. And then they say, after you process that, you have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with God. You go to contemplating. This is, this is very powerful. And people don't get this. Um, and Sky Jatani gave a very, very vivid illustration of this. And remember Dan Rather? Dan Rather is one of the excellent uh, interviewers like Ted Koppel, okay? So Dan Rather, when Mother Teresa was still alive, invited Mother Teresa to interview Mother Teresa on TV, broadcasted internationally. The first question he asked Mother Teresa is, oh, so you're really intimate with God. You serve God. Uh, what do you tell God when you have devotions with Him? And Mother Teresa said, I do not tell Him anything. I listen. <laughs> Dan Rather was taken by surprise, you know. And of course, he's an interviewer, a little, a little woman. <laughs> he put it to shame. So he tried to kind of recover and said, Okay, if you listen, what does God tell you? <laughs> it's a sharp guy. And Mother Teresa looks at Dan Rather and said, He doesn't tell me anything. He listens. Now, if you cannot understand that, Mr. Rather, I cannot explain it to you. Very powerful. Because sometimes you will have a problem in life where it's so heavy, you don't even know what to tell God. So what you do is you stand in God's presence. You don't say anything. No words from you. You just listen. And when you start listening to God, you will realize that God is listening to your heart. He's more anxious not talking to you but make you understand that He listens to you and listens to the eggs of your heart. You see how powerful that contemplating is? Now don't tell me your devotionals will not be changed after we learn about this. Your devotionals is the opening of memory verse. <laughs> Pray, Woo! bless this day, protect me from many, I'm in danger, zoom, you go out. No. You read. You allow the treating to examine your life. And then you react to that examination. And the moment you react, Lord, okay, fine. Let's, let's, let's dwell on this together. You will not hear anything from me now. I'll try to listen to you. 
and make me understand that you're listening to me as well. That's enjoying the presence of God. Then after that, ruminating is grabbing a phrase or a word in the thing that you read during the day and take it with you all the day while you're working or where you're going to school. In this particular case, if you were reading, if you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. You keep on repeating that in your head during the day. And while you repeat that, you reflect on your reading, your meditating, your speaking and contemplating. Uh, give this a try for 30 days. Okay? You will not go without it anymore if you do it faithfully for 30 days. Prayer will not be the same when you do it this way. And if you want to grow in Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, you follow this thing, you follow what we do, you are abiding through the Word of God and loving Him. This is something about knowing God and following Him, obeying Him, and delightfully serving God. All of this will be found here. And it's simple. This is very practical. Uh, nothing very fancy, nothing abstract. This is what you do. I'll tell you how powerful and effective this is. Um, in our small group Friday night, uh, every so often the kids encounter very heavy problems. They, them guys go to public schools. They, they got issues there. And you know what I said? They brought up a very big problem. I said, is there any problem that will not be addressed by this? So when I see Jem, they'll be leading out this afternoon, you'll probably see Jem. Jem, is, Jem didn't even want to believe in God a year ago. He, he wanted to throw everything away. Jem is gone. I don't even care about church. I don't care about God. Now he's on fire. <laughs> he wants to do... And one thing he learned during our small study is sometimes if you cannot pray, you just sit in the presence of God. But don't ever start the day without sitting in the presence of God. So we, in, in our Bible study group, we end, we end our Bible study group by what we call a rating session. A rating session is on a scale of 1 to 10, how was your walk with God during the week? I say somebody says, I'm a 4, I'm a 5, I'm a 10, I'm an 8, I'm a 7.5. And then, and then Jem basically said during one testimony, well, it was kind of hard this week because I really didn't know what to tell God <laughs> with all the things that I was going through. I didn't know what to pray. So I learned to just sit in His presence. And I want to sit in God's presence. I want to make sure I was with God that day when I started. It made a difference. Okay? I was so in, enthused when I heard Jem gave the testimony during our... Now, after our study last night, you will have no reason not to tell God anything. Because if you start with reading, abiding in His Word, and then you're honest, intellectually honest, if that's happening in your life, you will have something to say to God. And after you say something to God, maybe, it, I, I can, Lord, come on. I cannot forgive that guy, you know, that boneheaded guy in church. I mean, you expect me to, no way. And then you start talking with God. And then finally God said, hey, this is an example again. Terry, why don't you just shut up? <laughs> he didn't say, why don't you stop talking? Just sit there, listen to me, and I'll try listening to you. And then you sit there. Don't. That's why what it means of wrestling with God. I will not let you go until you bless me, says Jacob. What was he trying to say? I do not want to let go of this devotional until I felt your presence. And once I sense your presence, hey, I'm ready to ruminate during the day. I'll give everything to you. All right, so <laughs> it's amazing. We study the concepts of John 15. We go into the deep theological waters of Arminianism and Calvinism. And what we really need <laughs> is this. I'm not saying this is useless, okay? I'm not saying there's, just, there's no use. Uh, you know, th yes, there, there is a purpose for this. You, be you can better understand who you talk to among Christians. But in the final analysis, it's not how you understand this. It's not how you exegete this. This, are you in Jesus? Are you in relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you nurture that relationship every day? If you do this, then you will grow. That's why it's called natural church growth. If you do this every day, you will naturally grow in Him. You don't concentrate on the fruit. The more you dwell with Jesus Christ, you will realize the more understanding you become. 
the kinder you become, the more willing you are to serve, the more humble you become. So if you want to take away something, yes, eh, take these notes. Take this, you can read this. But take this and practice this, okay? That's what I'm trying to say. Do this, I'm saying, I'm challenging you for the next 30 days, do this every day, okay? And I'm telling you, if you start practicing it tomorrow, you will not let go of that practice after 30 days. You will miss the time with God. And you tell me, oh, amen, how can I pray for 10 minutes? That's too long. <laughs> Your people, you practice this, you will spend a lot of time with God. I know you guys, I didn't see this, the look of skepticism in your faces, but try it. It will make a very big difference. Okay, that's it. That's a, that's, that, like as I said, Pastor David will be here, and I told him some background there as how to recover the lesson. We don't do it Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. We give, a, we give, a, we give an outline and we process it. I hope you have been the same animation with him, ask him the same questions. We're living like Jesus will be next week. Or he'll, he'll be helping us out. And if you did not catch it, it's not announced yet. Uh, by the time we upload this, it will be announced tonight anyways. We already have a new pastor, okay? And we're hoping that the new pastor will help out in the rotation of the, the Sabbath School lesson preview. And with Pastor David Kokyong helping out too, I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys will pick up a lot of stuff with what we're doing. Meanwhile, grow in Jesus. How do you grow in Jesus? Abide in Him. Okay. Hey, come on, Bing. Don't stop talking in parables. Okay, how do you abide? Here. Okay, I'm not talking in parables here anymore. I'm talking about right there. Okay. Very practical things that you can do. You do that, this will be a lesson in Sabbath school you will never forget. If you start doing that, you will abide in Jesus. You will be very fruitful when that happens. Okay. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what we covered. Uh, we look into the words of Jesus in John 15, of abiding in Him, of residing in Him first, and continually remember that it is only through grace that we can walk our Christian walk. We delve into the deep waters of theology of Calvin, of Arminius, and John Wesley. Uh, Teach us to be humble enough to understand that there are things of God, things of you, that we are not capable of comprehending. And give us the faith to trust you and submit to you in those cases. And where we do understand, teach us to abide and be faithful, obedient, and follow you. And, oh Lord, I pray that as we learn, there's a way to have an intimate relationship with you every day. Teach us to read to meditate on what we've read, to speak to you about it, teach us to contemplate and enjoy your presence every day. And give us more words every day to ruminate on and make us grow in Jesus Christ and fruits will follow and your name will be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.